Okay. Hi, I'm Kathy Treglia. I'm the Executive Director of Education for YMCA South Coast. We're here today at the Fall River YMCA to help eradicate child sexual abuse. We've asked local agencies to come together, form a task force, and spread the word to other agencies in the hopes that we'll train 5% of the South Coast population, or 14,000 adults. We have a training called Darkness to Light that we want to use to train teachers, counselors, child care workers, teachers, coaches, and we're hoping that this will make an impact in the awareness and prevention of child sexual abuse in the South Coast. My name is Gary Schuyler, I'm the president of YMCA South Coast and I appreciate your uh, interest in this subject and uh, um, decision to come this morning. Um, before I finish with uh, one of my opening comments, I thought we could go around and um, everybody introduce themselves. And why don't we start with here? Yeah. Uh, name and organization. Um, I'm Madeline McCauley and I'm an intern at the DA's office. I'm Sylvia Redmond, I'm the chief of the Special Victims Unit at the District Attorney's Office. Rochelle Foley, I'm a coordinator at St. Vincent's Home. Nasha Macedo, Education and Outreach Coordinator of the CAC. Uh, Jennifer Salem Russo from St. Anne's Youth Trauma Program. I'm Tracy Abbotson. I'm the Director of Community Health Benefits at St. Anne's Hospital, and I'm also a foster mom. And this is good for me. Very cool. Jessica Costigan, Associate Director at the CAC. Carrie Mello, I'm the Community Benefits Manager for South Coast Health System, which includes Charlton here in Fall River. I'm uh, Marsha Picard. I'm the School Wellness Coordinator for Greater Fall River Partners for a Healthier Community. Barbara Beckman, I'm the Site Director for the Fall River Office of Child and Family Services. Michelle Arantia, Director of the Children's <coughs> Advocacy Center. Tom Dunson, the O'Connor Y, and also representing the Fort Worth DCF Career Board. I'm Elaine Lucas, and I'm the Director of the Fort Worth DCF Office. I'm Lucy Canuel, and I'm the Area Director of the New Bedford DCF Office. Eric Bullock, Community Affairs and District Attorney's Office. Peter McCarthy, Director of the Boys and Girls Club in Fall River. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Esperanza Alejandro Barbie, and I am with the New Bedford Housing Authority. Good morning, Dave DeCosmo, Scott Lunar Center's Youth Development Manager. Thank you all. Um, so, uh, so the statistics say that one in four girls and one in six boys will be sexually abused by their 18th birthday. Um, you know, I first became real, really aware of this issue um, probably back around 1990 around the Father Porter case um, out of the North Attleboro um, uh, Church. Um, it was St. St. Um, Mary's Church in North Attleboro, and uh, that situation hit the press around 1990, and um, my wife, yeah, I think he left in 63, and my wife grew up in North Attleboro and, and moved to North Attleboro in 64, and when we when it hit the press, some of the names of the victims that came out who were bold enough to, to get involved with this, those were the kids that went to school with her, and um, the same age. And, so, you know, it was kind of a little personal connection as well. And then 10 years later, um, the uh, um, 2000, the Christopher Weirden case um, hit, the, hit the press. And the Christopher Weirden case, um, I'll just read from it, from an article in the newspaper. Calling it possibly the largest single child abuse case in Massachusetts history, Essex District Attorney Kevin Burke uh, yesterday said a Milton man who had worked with youth at a Catholic church, and the YMCA was the name of his YMCA, may have molested as many as 250 boys in communities north of Boston. And so this is the press in 2000. And so during that time frame, our organization and youth serving organizations around the country were, you know, kicking up um, their prevention, you know, how, they, how they dealt with prevention and, and their whole awareness campaigns. And, um, and last night I, I got a little wee affirmation of it. Uh, Michelle was uh, kind enough to, to do a training to her uh, 150 of our staff uh, for the summer camp about a week ago. And so right now we're in intensive training for, for camp and, um, to address this issue. And so last night I was talking to, did my thing to, uh, to individual camps and I was talking to the kids at the Nevada Hawaii staff at the Nevada Hawaii camp and I, I mentioned this case. 
And I said, 250 kids. You know, how does, how does that happen? And this boy, a man, 1920, you know, first, this is his first job with us. He'd never worked with us before. This young man says, well, they must have allowed grooming to happen. And I think back in 1990, we wouldn't have known that term. You know, it would not have been a term that, that would have been used, and we wouldn't have had, we did not have policy, or we were just developing them, policies in place to prevent that, you know, um, uh, connecting with kids after, you know, outside of the organization. So, this is a child that just started working with us. Child, I can pass that, I'm a grandfather, sorry. 19-year-old's <laughs> <laughs> a child. <laughs> um, so this is a young man that just started working for us, and he is gay. So obviously, we've come a long ways as organizations in, in preventing this and, and dealing with it, but it's still, if you think, one in four and one in six, we haven't come far enough. Um, uh, so a few organizations, uh, um, uh, a few months ago, got together and we created this task force, and for lack of a better term, we call it the South Coast Child Protection Task Force. It's really self-formed. Uh, we're gonna invite you to join us later on. Um, and the goal of the task force is to lower the incidences of child sexual abuse in the South Coast region by raising the awareness in education and empowering adults on how to recognize, react, and prevent child sexual abuse. The task force aims to educate 5% of the region's adult population or 14,000 adults with child sexual abuse awareness training by the year 2020. 5% of the adult population, so there's a belief um, we're going to hear um, about the Stewards uh, Children Program and Dr. Stolite a little, little bit. And, and they believe that if you can do an awareness program to 5% of the adult population, you can start to move the needle on this one. So we're just, we're just trying to move the needle somehow. Um, at this point in time, before we start with the Dr. Stolite piece, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle and Sylvia and tell a little bit about why they're involved. In well, I just want to start by saying that something that Gary said that's really important is that, come on, Michelle, is that it's not kids that can prevent it, no matter what you do in a school and what you say and how much you tell them to, to tell mom or your daddy or their loved ones, it's adults that can prevent it. The whole point about child abuse is that it's usually somebody that's older, has more authority, has more control, and it's intimidating for a child. No matter what we tell a kid, it's not fair to put prevention on their shoulders. They're not going to do it themselves. It's got to be adults. And that's really important to remember. And I think when you hear this, you'll see why. It's, you know, 75, how many, at least 80% of the abusers are known trusted loved individuals. We all know that. We work in the field. Um, so to expect a child to say no or defend themselves or tell is not going to happen. So that's why this is so important for us to let the public know about that phenomenon. The, um, and try to localize it, you know, we, we talk a lot about national statistics, but on a, on a local level, I can speak to what's happening at the Children's Advocacy Center. You know, since we opened our doors in 2007, we've had an 83% increase in the cases that we've served. And I think there's a, a number of contributing factors to that. Um, but, you know, in terms of what we're serving in Bristol County in the uh, seven and a half short years, um, we're upwards of 600 families a year that are presenting to the center with um, allegations and usually disclosures of abuse. Uh, it screams for the need for prevention. Um, and when Gary was talking, I was saying, boy, Rome, Rome still isn't built in a day when you think about the Christopher Regan case in the early um, 2000s. You know, and then, you know, the more national uh, Jerry Sandusky cases of the world, which are now four or five years old, um, we're pretty passionate about localizing this issue to talk about what's happening here in our, in our own backyard. Um, and the CAC is really happy to be a part of um, the why that has really been mobilized because of the Christopher Reardon case way back when with this um, darkness to light curriculum. One of the things that I want to explain that the task force has been working on for the last many months is kind of awareness and prevention um, on a continuum. So organizations that are working with children every single day, the Children's Advocacy Center and the DA's office has been offering this kind of more intensive technical assistance on, on how to recognize and respond, teaching folks how to do minimal facts interviewing, not to taint a case so that it affects the outcome from the, in the criminal justice system. 
This um, Darkness to Light initiative is more of an awareness campaign that's addressed at reaching the community and asking all of you for your engagement and helping us build capacity, and Gary will talk more about that at the end, but we want to build capacity uh, because it takes a village to reach the numbers that we want to reach um, with this awareness campaign. So I just want you to uh, kind of keep that in mind as you're going to see um, a portion of the Darkness to Light. This is aimed at reaching the population um, in society, of which there are many, that don't want to believe that this issue exists. For those of us that are in youth-serving organizations, we live this reality every day. But we know that awareness and education are the first steps to prevention. Um, and why we believe that the darkness to light will help us build that capacity for awareness and education. The one piece that we don't address in darkness to light, we've all talked about it in the task force, is what to do once you are getting a disclosure, what's the best way to deal with it, and we've talked about this. And what we would say to all of you is when you do talk to your organizations, if this happens, we can supplement that. Michelle and I can supplement that piece of it for you and do a special training if need be because it's really important. For now, we just want to maximize awareness so that there are more disclosures. Part of the good news with them, our increased numbers in the CAC, is that they've gone up because people are talking, they're disclosing, and it's delayed disclosures, granted, most of the time. But at least they're disclosing, and if we can, as adults, make kids comfortable enough to talk about it and come out with it, they're going to come to this to the wonderful CAC, you know, get what they need, you know, 51 A's will be filed and we'll be able to go forward. The more that happens, the more difficult it becomes for predators. So that's our goal initially, but just so you know, there is another piece to it if you need that other piece. And that's not going to necessarily be addressed here. Thank you. The goal is to try and educate 5% of the adult population, and that's really why you're here to see if um, you know, you'd be willing to partner with us in trying to get to that 14,000 number and beyond uh, with an awareness campaign. So we're rolling out an awareness campaign. So that's why you're here today, to, to learn about this awareness campaign that we're, that we're going to do. And we have two dynamic trainers who've gone to the training session to learn about how to present darkness to light. And it's Nasha and Kathy, Nasha from the CAC and Kathy from uh, YMCA South Coast, who are going to introduce us. How many people are familiar with darkness to light? Oh, yeah, that's good. It's a, it's a non-profit um, national organization, and it provides individuals, organi organizations, and communities with schools to protect children from sexual abuse. It's an evidence-based platform, and they have trained, Dr. Stoll has trained more than 7,000 facilitators in 50 states and 16 international locations. So it's the largest network of child protection advocates in the world, and to date, almost a million adults have been trained. So when we formed this task force, we looked at a lot of different tools and felt like this one, being that it's an evidence base, is so widespread that it would be one of the best for us in the South Coast community. This training is for all different types of people who work or live with children. It can be for parents, educators, volunteers um, that work in your agency, faith-centered teachers, college students, and coaches, and that's just a short list. They may have left people off. The training is two hours. It's interactive. It provides um, two 15-minute discussions after a 35-minute video. So a 35 minutes, 15-minute discussion, 35 minutes, 15-minute discussion. Um, it's it's only an awareness training. It's not intended to teach or to guarantee you know identifying sexual offenders, but it's a start. And so. We're going to introduce you to this training. Nasha's, oh, thank you so much. Nasha's handing out the workbook, which is like right the next thing I was reading on my notes. <laughs> and we're asking that you return these notebooks, so please not write in them. If you host a training, um, the Darkness to Light does have a copyright on this program. And so you give each of the participants a workbook. So there's a fee. When we buy these books from Darkness to Light, they're $10. They get to keep those. And as you're watching the video, you can go along in the book, and that's where the questions and the interactive activities come in. So, it's all you So, as Kathy said, um, these are the books that you guys can follow along to see what we're going to be showing you today in regards to the Darkness to Light. 
Um, so today, what we're going to do is we're just going to give you guys an introduction as to Darkness of Light. So you're going to see kind of like the first part of Darkness of Light. So there's step one. Um, there's five steps that go into Darkness of Light, but you're only going to see until step one is over. So you can follow along in your books, um, and then we're going to begin. Welcome. This is Darkness to Light's Stewards of Children. I'm Paula Sellers. At Darkness to Light, we have a vision of a world free of child sexual abuse, a world in which every child is loved protected and nurtured, and is free to grow up healthy with their sexual boundaries intact. This is the birthright of every child. Our goal is nothing short of ending child sexual abuse. Many of you are connected to child sexual abuse. You may be the parent or grandparent of a child who's been sexually abused. You may have a friend or sibling who was abused. You may be a professional serving a child who is being abused today, or you may be a concerned adult. We want you to come away confident and competent, knowing how to prevent child sexual abuse from happening and how to react skillfully if it occurs. Some of you may be survivors. We trust that you'll experience affirmation and empowerment. Now, some of you may be sexually abusing a child breaking safe boundaries, or thinking about children in ways you shouldn't. This training will show you how damaging sexual abuse can be. It's vital that you seek help to stop. At Darkness to Light, we know that ending child sexual abuse takes a cooperative, community effort, nothing short. When we prevent child sexual abuse, we address a root cause of social problems, like violent crime, homelessness, teen pregnancy, health problems, and substance abuse. We are working for this, and when you join us, you'll contribute to a happier world. You will meet several survivors, all who have come a tremendous distance into personal power. I was the bright blonde hair and blue sailor suits, and you do what you're supposed to do. We had the dogs in the river and homemade biscuits and life was wonderful. Uh, Fisher was the athletic trainer for the football team. What a great place for a pedophile. I hold the school much more responsible than Fisher, you know, not because they have deep pockets, because I think they just willfully let children get hurt. I was born to a schizophrenic mother. Um, she was not able to care for me because of her mental illness. So I was placed with my aunt. My aunt was a very strict disciplinary. I grew up in church. Um, I would say it became very physically um, abusive. At the age of four, I started to be sexually abused by some adult cousins who were also in the household. Margaret Holser. I am a two-time Olympian, three-time Olympic medalist. So I was abused from five to seven years old um, by a good friend of mine's father. I was going to their house on a regular basis for play dates. They were coming to my house on a regular basis. So this was a man that I trusted, that you know my parents trusted. My dad uh, moved back and forth from the United States to Guatemala so he pro can provide for the family. And then the, the Latin American community is we just tend to, to live in a large cluster of people. And um, when my mom used to go out with my other aunts to go shopping, they left my older cousins there to stay with us. And it was this one specific cousin. Um, but it was him specifically that, that kind of targeted me. As a child, you don't think of, of adults as manipulative or or hurtful or anything like that. But I can tell you that the first time I met this man, I had concerns about him, and yet we continued to allow him to be a part of our lives. And part of that was because there was a professional relationship. 
he was on staff with my husband um, at, at our church. Well, there was a cousin, a female cousin of mine that used to come and visit often and just started off as little small events leading up to much larger events. You know, she would have me to touch her or she would try to touch me. The other abuse um, started around age seven and um, my mom, she had a living boyfriend at the time who was a firefighter. He would sneak into my room in the middle of the night and initially I thought it was a dream. I grew up in the picture perfect family. I was called the debutante Miss America. I was the first Miss America that they ever brought a family up on stage. My father continued to sexually violate children and teenagers until he died at age 75. You know, I was a regular kid, you know, my, unfortunately for us, my parents, uh, they didn't know that they were bringing someone who was a pedophile in. He was the, actually the teenage son of our, our babysitter. I still cannot even say what really happened other than he sex had sexual acts with me and had me perform, but I still can't say it. I mean, I don't know if I ever will. You'll also learn from partners in education, youth sports, mentoring, faith community, child advocacy, law enforcement, and parents. We all take care of children. You'll learn Darkness to Light's five steps to protecting our children, and you'll discover the personal empowerment skills to carry out those steps. <laughs>